The Siyata Deshmai, we're going to learn Shabbos Tafkuf Chof Alev. We're going to start about a quarter of the way down from the top of the Omid. Says the Mishnah, Nochri Shebo Lechabois, if unfortunately Chas Shalom a fire breaks out in the home of Ayid and a Goy, a Gentile, comes on his own accord and he wants to extinguish the fire, Ein Oimrim Loi Kabei, we don't tell him, we wouldn't tell a Goy, please go and extinguish the fire. But on the other hand, if he comes on his own, we don't need to tell him, don't extinguish the fire. If he comes and he does it, then he obviously feels it's worth his while and he's doing it for his own. He assumes he's going to get remunerated for it, he's going to get some payment and therefore he's doing it for himself and it's okay. We, Klal Yisrael, do not have the responsibility of making sure that a Goy does not do Malachas on Shabbos. He's allowed to do Malachas on Shabbos. If he's an Eved, if he belongs to me and he's working for me, then I'm not allowed to make him work on Shabbos. But an average, a normal Goy who wants to do a Malacha for me, as long as, he's not, as long as I'm not instructing him to do it, then he's allowed to do it. However, if a minor, if a young child comes and wants to extinguish the fire, in Shreminlay we do not let him extinguish the fire, because we have the we have the responsibility to make sure that even a young child does not do any malochus, certainly not if they're doing it for us. We'll see that in the Gemara. Says the Gemara. Omar Rib Ami. Bidleika Hitiru Loimar Rib Ami said that when it comes to a fire, one is allowed to say, so to speak, to oneself or to one's friends loud enough that a goy should hear, Kol Hamachabe Enoi Mafsid. Whoever's going to volunteer to put the fire out, he's not going to lose from it. He'll end up getting remunerated, he's not going to lose, in the hope that a goy will hear him, and a goy will then volunteer to put the fire out. And this is not saying to a goy, Please extinguish the fire. It's not, it's somewhere in the middle. Name a Sayali. We're going to try and bring proof to this Chiddush of Rav Ami from our Mishnah. What does it say in our Mishnah? We just saw in the Mishnah that you do, if you do not, you're not allowed to tell a Goy extinguish the fire, and you don't have to tell him don't extinguish the fire. So the Gemara says Kabe from the fact that it says in the Mishnah that I'm not allowed to tell him go and extinguish the fire. Kabe hu I mustn't tell him explicitly. We would be able to deduce from that. Ha kol mafsid, but to say something which is not an explicit request or instruction, that would be muta. That Omrin um, only, we're allowed to say, says the Gemara, no, you can't bring proof. Eima Seifa, what does it say immediately after that in the Mishnah? Al Tachabe, loy Omrin only, you don't have to tell him that stop doing it. But that just means if he does it totally on his own, I don't need to stop him. But I'm not allowed to say anything that would encourage him to do it, including saying, Anyone who does it will not lose. If he does it totally on his own accord, then I just don't need to stop him. Since one can deduce one way and the other way from the Mishnah, we don't know which word in the Mishnah is there to be deduced from and the other one is just said just to, 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 that the sentence should, be, should follow nicely. And therefore we don't know how to deduce from the Mishnah, so we cannot bring proof either way from the Mishnah to the halacha of Rav Ami. Continues the Gemara. Tonu Rabbonon. Maisa, there was an incident when Nofrod Leiko Bechatzeiru Shel Yosef Ben Simoi Beshichin. Unfortunately, a fire broke out in the courtyard of Yosef Ben Simoi in a place called Shichin. Ubo Anshei Gistera Shel Tzipuri Lechabois. And the men of, that were working for the governor of Tzipuri, they came to extinguish the fire. Why? This Yosef ben Simoi, he was the treasurer of the king, and therefore the men of the governor of Tzipuri came to extinguish the fire. And Yosef ben Simoi did not allow them to extinguish the fire, not because he felt it was osa, 
because they came on their own accord. And the Mishnah says you don't need to say al tachabe, don't extinguish. But he did it in the honor of Shabbos. V'nas Ness, a miracle happened. V'yordu Goshomim, and rain came down. V'chibu, and extinguished the fire. Lo'erev, in the evening, after Shabbos and Matzah Shabbos, Shigir l'chol echod mehem shtei sloin. Yosef ben Simoi sent two coins of a sela to each of the men that came to extinguish the fire. Ula Farkus, and to the lieutenant that was that was overseeing the operation, Shebohen Chamishim, he sent him fifty sloim. Ukeshashomu chachomim bedavor. When the Chachomim heard what had happened, that they had come to extinguish the fire, and he, he didn't let them, Omruloi the Chachomim said, Loi hoyo tzorich lekach, he did not have to stop them from doing it. Shahari Shaninu, because we learned in the Mishnah, Nochri Shabal Lechabois, Ein Omrim Loi Chabei Ve'al Tirbe, that a guy, you're not allowed to tell him to do it, but if he does it, you do not need to send him away. Continues the Gemara. We saw at the end of the Mishnah that if a minor, if a child, a Jewish child comes to extinguish the fire, we do not allow him to, because we are responsible to make sure he doesn't do malachas. Asks the Gemara, Shamas Minar, can we bring proof from here that cotton oichel novelo is based in Metsuvin Olov Lafrishai? That if a young child is about to eat something which is not kosher, it's a novela that based in are, are required to stop him. As we see here, she saw Sealen, that we are required to make sure that even a young child does not do any Averis. And can we bring proof from here to that halacha? It's something that's not so clear at all. It's discussed elsewhere in Shas. Omer Abyechanon said, No, Bekotten Ha'oiseledas Oviv. We're not talking about a child who's doing on his own. And then it's a discussion, a separate discussion, if Kotten Oichel Novela is based in Metsuvim La Frishai or not. Here we're talking about the child who's very astute and he's aware that he will be causing his father tremendous pleasure if he puts the fire out. And it's almost as if he's doing it under the instruction of his father. It's similar to the father instructing the child to do it. For the father to instruct the child to do it is like a father giving the child novelas to eat, and that's definitely osir. And so some say it's similar to giving a child novelas. Others say it's included in the posuk of loisasi kol melocho ato ubincho. Either way, if the child is doing it almost or doing it under the influence, so to speak, of the father, then it's osir. Ask the Gemara if the Mishnah is talking about that those who are who are helping are doing it, so to speak, under the instruction of the the owner of the house. Then the parallel of that with a goy would that be mutter? Because the Mishnah contrasts a goy to a child and says a goy you don't have to stop him. A child you have to stop. If you have to stop the child because he's doing it under instruction of his father, then. If a slave, if, if a guy, sorry, is doing it under instruction of a yid, he's also not allowed to do it because that's called kabe. You're not allowed to tell a guy to do it. The kavosoga benochri the kaovid ledaited is shal mishori. Is a guy allowed to do it? Is are we allowed to allow a guy to do it if he's doing it at daited the yisrael? He's doing it in order to to please the yisrael. Says the Gemara, nochri ledaited the nafshe of it. A guy who's an adult. And he knows that uh, the Yisrael is going to pay him for it. So he's doing it. He's doing it on his own accord. He wants to make some money. And that's okay. The child is doing it purely to please his father. That is not allowed. Says the next Mishnah. One's allowed to invert a bowl on top of a lamp whilst it's alight. As long as you're not going to extinguish it. You're allowed to invert a bowl over it in order that the beam on top of the lamp will not get burnt. And we've already seen in a Gemara previously what the Chiddush is here on Daf Mem Gimel. We learned about this, that normally you're not allowed to move a vessel in order to serve something that's mukta. And over here, the lamp is mukta. How are you allowed to move even a bowl, which the bowl in and of its own right is not mukta, but you're moving in order to, to serve the lamp, that should be also there's a chiddush. It's mutter. He may be. He may. It's talking about. He's got in his hand anyway. It's a sugya that we learned previously. So the Mishnah says you're allowed to invert a bowl on top of this lamp. Val tsoya shell cotton, and you're allowed to invert a bowl on the excrement shell cotton. 
of a cotton, for a cotton, because of a cotton, that's something we're going to see in the Gemara. Val akrov shaloi tishech, and you're allowed to invert a bowl on top of a scorpion in order to, to prevent it from biting you. Omer Yehuda, ma'is bo lifnei Rabbi Yechonon ben Zakkai. An incident came in front of Rabbi Yechonon ben Zakkai regarding a scorpion, and we're not talking about a scorpion that's chasing a person, because that's clearly pikuach nefesh, one's allowed to do anything to save oneself. Here we're talking about a scorpion that could potentially hurt a person and, and even be lethal, but this particular scorpion was not a th- posing a threat at that point. And Rabbi Yechanan said, Ba'arov, in a place called Arov, there was such an incident, and he said, Va'omar, I suspect that the person that inverted this bowl over the Akrov, which is a Meloch of Tzeda, of trapping, I suspect that he's Chayev Chatos, because there was no reason that, he, there's no good reason that he should have been allowed to do that. Says the Gemara, Rav Yehuda, Rav Yirmiya Ba'aba, Rav Chonon Barova, Iklu Lebe Ovin de Min Neshikya. Three Chachomim went to visit Rabbi Ovin in a place called Neshikya. Rav Yehuda, Rav Yirmiya Ba'aba, and Rav Chonon. Le Rav Yehuda, Rav Yirmiya Ba'aba, um, Ovin, Ovin de Min Neshikya, he, when Rav Yehuda and Rav Yirmiya came, Aisu Luhu Paraisa, he gave them beds on which to recline on. Le Rav Chonon, however, Rav Chonon, who was one of the three, he came in with them. Le Rav Chonon bar Abba, loy aisile. He didn't give him a couch to recline on, and he had to sit on the floor. It's not clear exactly why he did that. Maybe he held that Rav Chonon bar Abba, bar Rava, was not on the same stature as the other two Chachomim. Either way, Rav Chonon bar Abba was, bar Rava was not very happy about this. And he was going to take measures to try and rebuke, and uh, um, he was going to rebuke Ovin. Says the Gemara, Ashkechei, Reb Chonon noticed, he found that Masni Le Lebre, that Ovin was teaching a Mishnah to his son. What was he teaching him? The Mishnah, the, the halacha we learned in our Mishnah. What did we see in our Mishnah? That you're allowed to koifin bukori, allowed to invert a bowl, v'al or shell cotton, which means over the excrement, shell cotton. So what did, how did Ovin explain to his child, he said, Tsoyo shell cotton, mipnei cotton. It's referring to the excrement, the fishes of a child, that you're, one is allowed to invert a bowl over them, mipnei cotton, in order that the child should not dirty himself in the, in the excrement. Omar Lee, so Rav Chonon said now to respond to Ovin, Ovin shatyo, Ovin the foolish, he's teaching to his child something foolish. He adds more, if you're talking about the excrement of a child, the excrement itself is prepared for the dogs. The dogs nibble at it and can eat it, and therefore it's not muktza. If it's not muktza, why do you have to invert a bowl on it? You can just move them away. V'chitaymen, are you going to say, well, that the truth is that even though it's the excrement of a child, it is muktza because it wasn't fit of yesterday. If it was already, if it was fit for a dog to eat, when Shabbos came in, it's not muktza. Over here, the child only, only passed his bowels sometime over Shabbos. So if it was not fit from when Shabbos came in, it was not fit for the dogs, then it will become muktzah. It's, it's muktzah. Says, that, says the, the Gemara, no, and this is not really the Gemara, this is Rav Chonon still explaining. He says, now I can prove to you that's not the case. Vatani we learned in the Braisa. Nahoro is hamoishchin, the flowing streams. Umayono is hanoivim, and the gushing springs. Harehein karagle kol odom. We know there's a halacha, that a person, wherever he is, fixes his place, wherever his Shvisa is where he's, where he's, where he's fixed. When Shabbos comes in, he's not allowed to go beyond 2,000 Amas from there. If he's in the middle of a city or a town, then 2,000 Amas from the edge of the city. These are alochas we're going to learn as we travel through Shas. Now, the same aloha applies to the objects belonging to a person, that my objects are not allowed to be moved more than 2,000 Amas from where I was on the onset of Shabbos. 
What happens if you have an object that doesn't have an owner? So the halach is wherever the object was at the onset of Shabbos, one's not allowed to move it more than 2,000 amas. The Brisa says, however, flowing water, which was not fixed when Shabbos came in, it was not koina shvisa, and therefore anyone can take water, even though it traveled from far away, you're allowed to take water and karagli kolodom, you can carry it as far as you're allowed to carry, as far as you're allowed to go with it, obviously assuming there's an Eruv and if it's Yontav you're allowed to carry. Either way, putting the, halachas, the other halachas of Shabbos aside, the, and Shabbos or Yontav, since this water was in transit all the time, then it was not koina shvisa, and therefore you can take the water from whenever it is and go with it wherever you're allowed to go. So what do we see from here? Even though the water that I'm taking now was not here when Shabbos came in. When Shabbos came in, who knows how many kilometers, how many miles away it was. Why is it not Mukta? The answer is, Elo. The answer is because since the water was traveling and everybody knew that water flows, then everybody had in mind, it was predicted, it was predictable that there's going to be water here. So even if the water is not here now, the fact that it was predictable means that it was in my mind when Shabbos came in, and therefore it's not Muktza. So Rav, Rav Honon said the same as with the fishies, the excrement of the child, even though it was not there at the onset of Shabbos, but it was very predictable that there would be some fishies. And therefore it was predictable that those fishies, whenever the child l- lets them out, is going to be fit for the dog. And therefore it's not Muktza. If it's not Muktza, then the Mishnah that says you're allowed to invert a bowl over them cannot be talking about the fishies of a child. And therefore, Rev Honon said that the way Ovin explained to his child that we're talking about Tzoyo Shel Cotton is not correct. So Ovin asked Rev Honon, I hear what you're saying. How are you explaining the Mishnah? The Mishnah says Tzoyo Shel Cotton. What Tzoyo are we talking about? And what's the cotton got to do with it? Eimer says of Honon, the Mishnah means Al Tzoyo Shel Tarn Regoilim Mipnei Cotton. We're talking about the excrement of, of, of the chickens and they are not fit for the dogs. And the reason that you, you're allowed to invert the bowl over them is mipnei cotton, in order that a child should not dirty himself in them. And that's how you should have learned the Mishnah, not like you taught your child that it's toyo shell cotton. That's as far as the dialogue went. Asks the Gemara, v'teipik lei dehavi graf sharei. So you just explained, you, Rav Honon, explained the Mishnah, that the Mishnah is talking about the excrement of chickens, they are mukta, but you're allowed to invert a bowl on top of them. Why are they mukta? Why are they not similar to a, a vessel, a grafshari, a vessel of, of excrement, which is very repulsive, and there's alocha, that one is allowed to move a vessel which is very repulsed with excrement, you're allowed to move it on Shabbos, it's not mukta. So too, the excrement of the chickens, it's repulsive, you can move them. Why do you have to invert a bowl on them? The reason you're allowed to move a vessel which is saturated with excrement and is very repulsive, agav mono, the, the vessel itself is not wouldn't be mukta. What would be mukta? The excrement in it. For that, there's a chiddush. The halacha is you're allowed to move the vessel even though it's a it's it's a base for the excrement. Why? Because it's very repulsive, and the chachamim allowed you to do that. But only agav mono, when you have the vessel in, then you have this chiddush that you can move it. But if you have the excrement not in a vessel holding it, maybe you're not allowed to move it. That's completely mukta. Says the Gemara, no, I can prove to you not that way. There was a mouse that was found amongst the spices of Ravashi. He said, you can take it with its tail. It's not in a kli. You can lift it up with its tail. And you can take it out. It's very repulsive. So you see that you're allowed to move something repulsive, even if it's not in a kli. So if so, if the Mishnah is talking about the Tzoyo Shel Tarnagoylim, why do you have to invert a, ves- a bowl on it? Why can't you just remove it? Answers the Gemara Ba'ashba. It's, we're talking about it was in a, in a trash pile 
And in a trash pile, it's not repulsive because that's where it belongs. And people don't get repulsed by a trash pile. When you have something repulsive in the middle of your yard or in the middle of, in the middle of, of your home, then it's repulsive. Asks the Gemara. You explained that mipnei cotton, the reason that you're allowed to invert the bowl over it, is because you don't want a child to dirty himself. Now you're saying that where's this excrement of the chickens? It's in the trash pile. What's, the, what's your young child doing in the trash pile? The trash pile was typically in the Rosh Hashanah, in a public domain. Why is your child in a public domain? The cotton, my boyle, what's your uh, cotton, the ch- young child doing in the trash pile? Says the Gemara Bechotza, we're not talking about a trash pile. What we actually meant was in a chotza. In the home, it's what's uh, typically very repulsive, it's Graf Shel Rei. Over here, it's in the chotza. It's not Graf Shel Rei, it's not repulsive. And nonetheless, young children are there. And therefore, you're allowed to invert the bowl on it. Asks the Gemara chotza, nami Graf Shel Rei yuhu. In your courtyard, it's not repulsive. It's, it's almost as repulsive as in the house. So even there, it's not mukta. So you're allowed to move them away. So why would you invert a bowl on it? Says the Gemara, We're talking about the trash pile, which is in the chotza, in the courtyard. So it's not Graf Shel Rei because it's in the trash pile, but the young children are still hanging around there because it's in the courtyard. And that's what the Mishnah means. You're allowed to invert a bowl over those that Tzoyah Shel Tarnagoylim. Continues the Gemara. Val Akrov Shaloi Tishach, we saw in the Mishnah, one's allowed to invert a bowl and trap a scorpion that it should not to stay safe and make sure that it's not going to harm you. Omar Rabbi Shua ben Levi. Rabbi Shua ben Levi said the following halacha. Kol hamazikin, any lethal creature, any creature that potentially could kill somebody, neherogin b'shabbos, even though they're not chasing you, they're not posing a threat at this point, you're allowed to kill them on Shabbos. Mosib Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef is going to ask from a brysa. Only five creatures are allowed to be killed on Shabbos, even though they're not chasing you. Ve'ilu in the house follows. Zvuv Shabaret Mitzrayim, a fly from Mitzrayim. V'tzira, a wasp, Sheba Ninveh, from the place of Ninveh. V'akrov, Sheba Chadayv, and scorpions from the place of Chadayv. V'nocho, Sheba Eretz Yisrael, the snakes in Eretz Yisrael. And V'kelev, Shoita, and a mad dog, B'kol Mokim, anywhere. Those five you're allowed to kill. And now Rav Yosef, who quoted this b'risa, is trying to understand this b'risa. Money, who's this b'risa following? Ilei me Rabbi Yehuda. If it's following Rabbi Yehuda, and we know this is an old machlekas, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon, if a melocha she'eno itzricha legufa is chayev or not. Because over here, you don't, want, you don't want the scorpion. You just don't want the scorpion to hurt you. So you're not trapping it to have the scorpion. So it's called a melocha she'eno itzricha legufa. So if this price is Rabbi Yehuda, Ha'omer melocha she'eno itzricha legufa, chayev oleo. He says that even a melocha that you don't need for itself, you're chayev. And over here that these creatures are not posing a threat, even these five creatures, why should you be allowed to trap them on Shabbos? El olav, if you're allowed to trap them on Shabbos, it must be Rabbi Shimon. And Rabbi Shimon says, a melocha she'eno itzricha legufa is mutar. So it's true that Rabbi Shimon says that midrabon on a melocha she'eno itzricha legufa is also, is also midrabonon, but we hear he said it was mutter because they can, they, potentially they could hurt a person. The honey, what do we see in this price? That these five, who do shori, only these five you're allowed to kill on Shabbos, achrin aloi, the, any other creatures you're not allowed to. And this is contrary to what Rabbi Shua ben Levi said, that kol hamazikin, any lethal creatures, are ones allowed to kill on Shabbos, and over here it seems in the Brisa that only these five. Omer Rabbi Yirmiya. Rabbi Yirmiya said that this Brisa that you of Yosef quoted, from which you're asking a question on Rabbi Shua ben Levi, this was not one of the Brises of Rabbi Chia, and not one of the Brises of Rabbi Oishia. The Brises of Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Oishia we know are 100% accurate and correct. This is another Brisa. Maybe the Brisa is corrupt. Maybe it's an inaccurately quoted Brisa. Man name alone, who's telling us the homotaretsta that he that this price is a correct price? Dilma Mashabeshtohi, maybe it's a corrupted brisa. Omer Vyasiv Vyasiv says, Anomas Ninalo. I was the one that received, I had the tradition of this brisa, but Isivna Lo, 
And I asked the question on Rabbi Shua ben Levi from this b'risa, and I'm going to explain to you why Rabbi Shua ben Levi is not a contradiction to this b'risa. Says, um, says Rav Yosef, that Rabbi Shua ben Levi was talking about when lethal animals are running after you, they're threatening you, then it's pikuach nefesh, then any lethal animal, you can do anything it takes to make sure you stay safe, However, the Brysa that I quoted, that is not, that's talking about when they're not running after you. And they're not running after you, then according to Rabbi Yehuda, you're not allowed to kill any. According to Rabbi Shimon, it depends which lethal animals. The five, these five that are that little bit more prone to get, become dangerous and to threaten a person, those you're allowed to kill, even if they're not running after you, the other lethal creatures, even according to Shimon, they don't pose such a, threat, uh, such a threat, and therefore you're not allowed to kill them on Shabbos. Continues the Gemara Tony Tane Kameid Rava. The Chochem that used to read and transmit the Brises in front of Rava, in front of Rava Baravuna, he said the following, Ha'hoyreg nechoshim v'akrabim b'Shabbos, somebody who kills any lethal animals, for example, snakes and scorpions on Shabbos, and we're talking about when, the, when these creatures are not tracing and threatening the person, the spirit of the pious people were not happy that you killed it. So Rav said to the person that was reading the Brayse to him, the spirit of the sages were not pleased with what these pious people S- said, these pious people said you should not kill them, and I, Rav, am saying that the, the sages hold that you should kill them. And this was Rav, the son of Rav Huna, who said that, and Rav Huna, his father, argued and said, Rav Huna saw that somebody killed a bee, which is also potentially it could harm a person, it could be lethal, and this person killed it, and Omalei Rav Huna said to him, Shlim tinu lukula, have you finished killing all the bees? There's, now all the bees have been destroyed and been annihilated in the world. That comment was, so to speak, you shouldn't have killed that bee. So you see from there, Rav Huna held, not like Rava, he said that even though it's potentially a lethal a creature, you should not kill it. Rava said that the Chachomim held, you are allowed to kill any potentially lethal creature. And Tosus discusses why this is not a contradiction to the Brises and the Sugya we mentioned before. Continues the Gemara Tonu Rabbonon. Nizdamnu loy nechoshim v'akrabim. If it happened to cross a, pass, a person's path, snake, snakes or scorpions. So the Brises says as follows. Horgon, if you managed to kill it, if you killed it, b'yodua nizdamnu loy lehorgon. Then you should know that Hashem gave you this opportunity to the privilege to kill this animal. These are dangerous animals. They could potentially kill somebody. Hashem wanted this animal killed. He was looking for a person with the merits to deserve to take to, to, to get rid of the danger. He chose you and you killed it. It's a sign that, that Hashem wanted you to have that privilege. Loi Hargon, if you crossed path with a snake or scorpion and you did not kill it, Biodua you should know Shin is Damnu Lahorgoi, that according to the letter of the law, that snake or scorpion was sent in order to kill that person because of an Avera that he did. and a miracle happened from Shemaim that that he didn't kill this person, and it was in order to arouse him to do tshuva. Oma Ullah, Vitaim Rabbi Barbar Khonom Rabbiechnon, either Ullah or Rabbiechnon said that boy, when do you know that crossing paths of a snake and scorpion means that the snake and scorpion was actually supposed to kill this person and it was a miracle that he didn't get killed is only if the snake is hissing at the person and is very clearly posing, so to speak, a threat at this person, then it's a miracle. You see that he, sh- he could have or should have been killed and Hashem saved him in order to allow him to do tshuva. Continues the Gemara. Omar ibn Abba bar Kahana. Pam achas nofal echod babesa medrash. At one point, a poisonous snake fell into the Besa medrash. Va omad nivosi echod. And a Jewish person from the place of nivosi, he rose up. Va and killed it. Omar Rebbe. And Rebbe responded to this nivoti person that killed it. 
He said, Poga boy kyoitsu boy. The snake was struck by somebody similar to it. Iboilu, they asked him, Poga boy kyoitsu boy, when you commented and said that that snake was struck by somebody similar to it, the Shapir of it, was that a compliment? Was that a virtue? That like the snake is a roid of his running after people to kill them, so to this person was the roid of to kill the roid of, and there was a virtue. Oiloi? Or were you saying in derogatory terms, as if to say that this person was kyotsuboy, was similar to the snake, in, is as evil as the snake, like we know the snake is the epitome of evil in the world, then so to this person, he was Michal Shabbos, he shouldn't have killed this snake. That's what they asked him. Tarshama, we're going to try and bring proof from, from the following incident, whether this person was right or wrong for killing that snake. Toshima, the Rab Abba, Bereid, Rab Chiyabar Abba, Rab Zaira. Rab Abba and Rab Zaira were sitting, have a Yosva. They were sitting, a killer on the porch, the Bay of Yanai, in the home of Rab Yanai. Nofak Milza mi Benayu, they were discussing a specific matter that they posed to Rab Yanai. And it is as follows. Boy, my name is Rab Yanai, they asked Rab Yanai. Mahu Larig Nechoshim Vakrabim Bishabas. Should a person kill snakes and scorpions on Shabbos? And obviously this is a question assuming that they are not posing a direct threat on the person. And are you, is, is one supposed to kill them or not? Omar Luhu Rabbi Yanai responded, Tzira and Yehoirig, I even kill wasps that are that bit less dangerous than snakes and scorpions. Nochosh v'akrab v'akrab le'kolchken. And it goes without saying that one should kill, and one can kill and should kill snakes and scorpions even on Shabbos. So it would seem from there that the person, this Nivasi person, did the right thing by killing the snake. Says the Gemara, no. Dilma it could be when Rabbi Yanai said, should you kill a snake? And he said he would even kill the wasps on Shabbos. Then he didn't mean go out of your way and go and kill it. It just means if you're innocently walking along the way and either a wasp or a snake or a scorpion or other dangerous animal is on your path, you don't need to go out of your way to avoid them. Just keep walking innocently and if you trample on it, you trample on it. It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to trample on it and if you did trample on it, it didn't have to die. Sometimes you can trample over one of these creatures and it will survive. So it's not opposite ratio. You don't really care. You're just busy going on your journey and innocently trampling it. And that's what Rabbi Anai said was okay. But to do what that person, that Nivasi person did, to go and kill the snake, you don't have a proof. Dom Rav Yehuda, we find a similar concept that Rav Yehuda, Roik if they will spit, spittle on the road, on the, on the earth, then you're not allowed to smear on Shabbos. You're not allowed to smoothen out the ground on Shabbos. And, sl- and stepping over spittle on Shabbos may well be doing that. It's smearing it. It's probably going to be flattening out the earth over there. Nonetheless, Rabbi Yudu says, Reik fituma. You mustn't go and, and, and flatten it out explicitly. But you're, you're walking and there's some spittle on the ground in front of you. You don't need to avoid it. Just walk and whatever happens, happens. That's a concept of lefitumoy, of innocently allowing something to happen, but not going out and specially doing it. Vomer of Sheishas, Nochosh Dorosoy lefitumoy. Rav Sheishas says a similar thing. If you're crossing paths with a snake, you don't need to avoid it. Just keep walking. You trample it, you trample it. It's okay. Vomer of Katina, Akrov Dorosoy lefitumoy. If you pr- cross paths with a scorpion, you can innocently just go over it, and whatever happens, happens. So maybe Rav Yanai just allowed that, and didn't allow explicit killing the snake, so we don't have any proof whether this Nivoti person did the right thing or the wrong thing. Continues the Gemara. Abba bar Marta, Abba the son of Marta, maybe it was his mother's name, to who Abba bar Minyumi, who is also known as Abba the, daughter, the son of Minyumi, maybe his father's name, have a mosque bay de Beresh Kalusa Zuzi. He owed the home the people of the Resh Galusa, the head of the Golas, Zuzi owed the money. I see who they, they brought him, they brought him to the palace, to wherever the Resh Galusa lived. And they used to torment him because he owed money to the home of the Resh Galusa. And it's interesting they did this. It seems that they did this on Shabbos. We'll soon see why I know that, but it's interesting that they did this on Shabbos. Now, those who suggest that maybe it wasn't on Shabbos and just the second half of this incident was on Shabbos, either way, it would seem that this was happening on Shabbos. Have a shoddy roika. 
there was some spittle on the floor in the home of the Reshkelusa. Omalu Reshkelusa, the Reshkelusa said to the people around him, Aisu mono, bring a vessel, schifu ilave, and invert it on top of the spittle. It's not nice, it's not respectable, I don't want to see it. Invert a, a vessel on top of it. Omar Luhu, so this Abba Bar Marta, Abba Bar Minyuma, said to the Reshkelusa, Leutzricha, so you don't need to invert a vessel on it. Hachi Omer Abihuda, Abihuda said, Roik, Doyosolifitumai, just allow people to innocently walk over it, and then it won't, won't be so despicable, it won't be so repulsive, you don't need to go out of your way and bring a vessel to invert over it. Omer Luhu, this, this Reshkelusa, and this is how I know it was on Shabbos, because this was a discussion about removing or hiding the spittle on Shabbos, and he was there because they brought him to the palace because he owed them money. It's interesting. But either way, Omar Luhu, the Resh Kalusa said, Tzuvarim Rabbonanhu, it sounds that this person is a learned person. Shavku, leave him alone, stop tormenting him. Continues the Gemara. We mentioned before an incident with Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, who there was a, the snake that fell into the Beis HaMedrash, etc. So now the Gemara is going to tell us another couple of incidents with Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana. Says the Gemara, Abba, Omar Abba Bar Kahana, Omar Bhanina. Pamuto is shall base Rebbe, the candelabra of the house, the home of Rebbe, Mutalatal on Bashabas, one's allowed to move them on Shabbos. Omar Le Rabzeira, Rabzeira questioned, but Nitlin Biyode Achas, is it only the very small ones that can be moved with one hand, or even the larger ones that typically one would fix a place for them and therefore they may be Mukta? Did are those also allowed to be moved? Omar Lehi said to them, he answered back, Abba Bar Kahana said, Like the, the candelabras in your father's house, those are the ones that you're allowed to move. And Rashi says that those were the small ones. But the larger ones, the one, the candelabras that you need two hands to hold, a person fixes a place for them, and therefore they are mukta, you're not allowed to move them. Continues the Gemara of Omer Abba Bar Kahana, Omer Bchanina. Kroina is the wagons shall be Rebi that were used to transport people. Mutala Taltal on Shabbos, one is allowed to move them on Shabbos. They have the same status as a kli, as a vessel. Omer Le Rabzeira, so Rabzeira questioned, Rab Abba, Benitlin Ba'odom Echod, Oy Bishnei Bnei Adam. Is that even, is that only a wagon that can be moved with one person, or even a larger wagon that needs two people to move it? Says the Gemara, Oma Lei, Ka'oisan Shal Beis Avicha, like the ones in your father's house, those wagons are the ones you're allowed to move. And Rashi doesn't explicitly say if they were big ones or small ones. It's a discussion in the Rishonim. Continues the Gemara of Omer Abba Bar Kahana, Hite Ulem Reb Chanina Lebeis Rebbe, Reb Chanina allowed the household of Rebbe, Lishto Yisyayin, to drink the wine, Bekroin Shal Nochri, that were transported in the wagons of a Goy. We know that if a Goy moves the wine then of a yid you're not allowed to drink it anymore and in that case it was some echod. if it's got a double seal the guy couldn't have touched it or done anything with it then it doesn't have the alochus of wine touched by a guy here he Rabchanina allowed the base rabbi to to drink this wine even though it only had a single seal velo yodan or abba kahana said i wasn't sure im mishum the sovar law did Reb Hanina allow it because he rules and says the Aloch is the Aloch is like Rebbe that says that one seal is always enough or no normally you need two seals because if there's just one seal it's not enough proof that the guy didn't pour from it when you weren't looking but over here because of the fear that the Goyim had from the home of Rebbe Rebbe was the Bein Asiya. he was the, the leader of the generation of Kralis Shaul and he was Put, given in that he was put in that position by the authorities, and therefore nobody would have dared to do anything to the wine, and therefore it was you could comfortably assume that the guy didn't pour from it, and therefore you're allowed to drink it. And 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 the Gemara says that we don't know why it was mutter. In the next year, we're going to continue the next Mishnah.